This is Rugger Matrix International, the world's leading independent rugby podcast quoted more than anyone else. It's no wonder that our major partner is Strike, Australia's leading provider of Bluetooth car kits, so you can stay safe in your car and avoid hefty fines. So go hands-free with Strike. Enter the code Rugger Matrix and you'll get 10% off. Go to strike.com.au to get your discount. Rugger Matrix also brought to you by mybean.com.au. We sell at roasters' prices. Let's get it on. Hello and welcome to episode 204, the Rebel Commander. Pretty good headline and caption and title, Mark Cashman, as you join me for Rugger Matrix. 204, Bronk. That's the uh, number of the bus you used to get to school way back in the day. Oh, that's way back in the day. All right, let's don't waste any time and get straight to our special guest. He's uh, giving us some time from his headquarters at the Melbourne Rebels. And as you look over our shoulder and see the man himself, it is the former Munster boss and now head of the Rebellion in Melbourne, <laughs> head coach of the Melbourne Rebels, Tony Began. Tony, thanks for joining us on Rugger Matrix episode 2,204, almost 2,000. It feels like 2,000. <laughs> no worries, guys. A pleasure to be here and great to, uh, great to talk to you this morning. Wonderful. Uh, really going to uh, enjoy chatting to you about the Rebels and a bit about uh, uh, the Six Nations as well because of your involvement with Munster. But uh, look, uh, Tony, you're just out t- outside the Six. Uh, no team's really showing their hand so far as getting a good uh, break in the Super Rugby table. But what's your uh, assessment so far of the seasons of the, for the Rebels uh, a couple of rounds in? Yeah, look, Joe, we've, uh, we've had a really you know, competitive start so far. We're, we're four games in. Obviously, Crusaders' round one away for us was such an important result, you know, not only for the, for the club, but I think just internally get that first win away from, from overseas is really important. And for us to, to gather those little victories are, are vital as we continue to, to go forward. So for that, gives us great confidence within the group. Then we ran into um, you know, Waratahs and Brumbies back-to-back at home. Uh, you know, two very good sides, and you know, we really felt from ourselves that we probably lost those games more so than beaten, and we, you know, we were contributed to the to the back end of those games, uh, which could have went either way. They didn't, and that's where we find ourselves. And then to to rebound against Force, who've built up a really strong reputation at home, uh, you know, really since they've they've started, really, but you know, ever since the last few years, and to to withstand their fight back at the end and and get away with the result away from home again is, uh, you know, leaves us in a, you know, a, uh, an okay position going forward in the next uh, next few games in this block. Tony, your, uh, your bigger dogs there are uh, performing quite well. Higginbotham's going well. Young Luke Jones is going well. Sturzacker and also Tamati Ellison. Uh, they're the guys who are obviously uh, a, a key part of the leadership and a key part of the, the start of your season. Yeah, they are. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really lucky... You know, with the group that we have, they're all really good friends. They've all, um, you know, everyone that's that's come to the Rebels has moved here from interstate, so they really rely on each other a lot. So it's vital that, um, you know, we get strong leadership from them. And Higginbotham has been really strong. You know, Allison's a huge contribution uh, to what we do, Burgess, etc. So we've got a nice blend. We've got some guys there with a little bit of experience, but, you know, it's really our younger players that are really driving this program, the McMahons, the Serzakers, you know, the Debris Seniors, et cetera. It's these guys who are really, you know, putting those standards in of how they play and how they train each week. Tony, you're really keen, obviously a young club, but uh, not too many players have played 50 games for the Rebels so far. Is it something uh, uh, that you're keen to really get, um, I guess, some build history early? I think the Brumbies are very good at that, you know, really... I was really impressed. In some ways, out did the Waratahs with their grasp of history early and, and making it really important to, to cherish those little milestones along the way. Are you aware of that as you build this team? Yeah, very much so. And we, we've, um, you know, certainly even starting last year when we came into the program, we made sure, you know, with our photos and our captains and our, and our successes, you know, I know they're short in three years. It's really important that we still had something to hang on to. You know, we talked about being at a club like Munster has been around for so long. They've, it's an easy identifiable, and when you're creating it and doing it for the first time, that's always really difficult to make sure that you're on on target with that. So for us, you know, really important. As I said, the first win away from overseas, you need to make sure you recognise that, and we need to understand. You know, each week, you know, for example, we're trying to get two in a row 
uh, this week to add, have those little goals each each time and really important and the players can hang on to those and then they grow into bigger ones. Tony, uh, you mentioned Deborah Sini before, your, uh, your fly half. He seems to be settling into that role sort of quite well. Are, are you giving him enough uh, patience to to actually grow into the role? Because I, I think he can be something special. Yeah, look, we, 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 we think so too. And, you know, we've been lucky with such a large turnover of players. There's only two players left from four years ago uh, and one staff member. So the club's been through a huge change in creating uh, some stability in the playing ranks. The staff is really important. And, you know, last year we saw Sean McMahon emerge there and give him his time and let him go and develop. And, you know, he said Luke Jones going forward, Sturzak is... You know, and Jack, someone we identified early in the pre-season and said, look, we're going to back him at 10 to start the season and give him that time through pre-season to really take some ownership of the group and direction of the attack and for him to feel comfortable over a long period of time instead of just coming in round one and saying, right, mate, you're playing this week and, you know, having bottled up, he's been comfortable in that part all the way through. So he's someone with high hopes for. He's a big 10. Uh, you know, you saw some of his defensive hits on the weekend, which is not always... Um, you know, related to 10. So he's, uh, he's certainly making good strides. We've got to still be patient with him. But, uh, you know, he's someone we've got a lot of high hopes for. And the role of the NRC in, in his development? Huge. I, I think for us as a club, it was really vital. And I reckon it's really given us, you know, a great lead into this season. You know, as I said before, everyone from where we are moves to the club. So we don't have a lot of relationship-wise based on playing uh, etc. So we have people from all different parts as opposed to growing up Queensland, New South Wales through schoolboys, uh, under 19s, under 20s academy and having that relationship built over five or six years. Ours is, uh, starts again each year in, in most cases. So for us to get another three months training and playing together for a group of 14, 15 guys was invaluable. And for us, it wasn't necessarily the playing on the pitch and the style of rugby, just really being together again, training, playing, and understanding each other's games and people, what they can do, and building combinations. Talk about the influence, the experience, the calmness that Mike Harris brings. Vital for us, and he was a really important signing, and, you know, we were probably, you know, lucky in some respects. You know, the Australian market, when you go out to market, in some cases there could be one option or two options in some cases, and we were, you know, really lucky that Mike saw something in the, in the club um, that you know he could really grow into and he could really be contribute in a leadership role but also improve and, and play good rugby and we feel that he's doing that at this stage but you know everyone talks about his goal kicking which is of the highest order and that really has kept us really close in their last four games and in case is pushing us to get the two results we have so far but I think just his general demeanour uh, within the group he's a terrific guy he's, he's been around for a little while now and he brings a real calmness to the forwards, but also, as I said, the young Jack Debrecenis and Sturzak is in the back line. I was really impressed to hear you say about giving your, your fly half a chance to bet himself down and, and back his... You know, you've you got to back your 10, don't you? And, and make sure that, uh, yeah, you might make a few mistakes, but uh, when, when you're confident, uh, Tony, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in having a couple of games together, you're not panicking in those moments. Geez, I need to make this pass to make sure I'm picked next week, you know. You don't want to bring the whole game down, the whole team down, just to make sure you survive from week to week. Yeah, it is. I think you've summed it up really well, and I reckon that's the big, the big challenge. It's all right for you know the sides with lots of internationals, but when you're bringing a young guy through, you know they're always uptight, and you want to give them that confidence that they can just play and express themselves. We all know how it is to start a new job or do anything for the first time. So these guys are no different, but have that confidence that you're going to get a, a run of games. Regardless of what you do, hopefully it's all good, uh, which we all happen. But if it if it's not, that they understand that there's some confidence in them, and you're going to back them. And I think, you know, we know down the track we're going to we're going to get the benefits of that. You know, from Jack, we're getting, you know, a lot of a lot of positive signs now, and we expect that to increase going forward. Yeah, Casho, that's a great example too with Bernard Bernard Foley uh, with the Waratahs. Oh yeah, ab ab absolutely. Uh, Tony, you, you mentioned Sturzak there a couple of times through, throughout the, the first part of the show. I, I, I think he's capable of uh, upsetting the apple cart in terms of the, uh, the Wallaby uh, num number nine pecking order. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? There's, there's something special about him and uh, I think he might be a point of difference come a World Cup perhaps. 
Yeah, exactly. I, you know, we, again, we've got a lot of time for Nick down here. It's easy for us. We see him every day in our environment, and he, we see him playing, and we obviously watch his game very closely. But he's someone we have a lot of time for, both from a rugby perspective, and his game is improving all the time as he gathers game time. You know, he again last year was you know really playing Super Fifteen rugby for pretty much the first time with only a few you know most of his time coming off the bench. So his relationship with Jack during the NRC was really important as well. And, you know, his pass is improving, but he's got a real competitive spirit about him. His defence is improving as time goes on. He loves to run, and I think he probably gives, you know, again, another different dimension. He's got some pretty fair halfbacks in front of him at this stage, um, but he's also got some guys who maybe are leaving at the end of the year as well. So we think he's going to be a strong contributor to the Rebels, and we think a strong contributor to the Wallies, Wallabies um, in the years to come. Now, Tony, looking at the t- table, you're... Uh in ninth place but on 10 points, but you're only one point behind the Sharks who are in sixth position on the combined table. It's really tight. It is, and, um, you know, I, I think, as you see, this particular season unfold, I think you're seeing where, you know, any side can beat anyone on its day, and, you know, I think that's, you know, that's why you, you sort of love uh, American gridiron, don't you, about the competitiveness of those games and how every weekend it's only two or three points at it and very close and everyone's capable home or away to, to get a result. And I think you're seeing that seeing that now. You saw the Lions beat the Blues there last week. Um, you know, South African side beating a New Zealand side and you saw the Chiefs beat the Stormers on the weekend. So, you know, wherever they're travelling or wherever they're going to, to have that competitive nature each week, fantastic for the competition, fantastic for fans, not so great for coaches. <laughs> to Tony, Tony, you've you've had a, a, a dip early on into the New Zealand conference. What are your thoughts about uh, where they're at? That's uh, that's an extremely competitive conference, and uh, it seems as though the uh, the Australian conference has closed up a fair bit. Not not a, not a struck match between a lot of the Australian teams. No, it isn't. You know, the New Zealand one always. You know, I think the Derby's there. I think everyone enjoys watching those, don't they? They're just such. You know, they're fantastic. You know, Crusaders, Chiefs. You know, Highlanders, Chiefs the other week, Crusaders, you know, Blues. Uh, you know, they, they've got some great talent. They've got great players and they just keep on producing them, don't they? And the rugby that they play is fantastic. So, you know, there again is going to be a real, you know, a real dogfight with regard to their competition and their conference of who's going to who's going to get through there. And as, you know, as I said, getting that first place is so important. You know, I think you've seen the Brumbies. You know, really, they've they've had a really interesting start to uh, their season with the Reds, ourselves, then the Force, and then Reds again. So four of their games against conference players in their first five rounds is really interesting, and they've done really well and, and opened up a bit of a gap there. So and then the Waratahs this weekend. So I think the Brumbies have been certainly excellent in their approach. They look like they've improved again. You know, their group's been together for a little while. So, you know, they've got a good coaching staff there and really well led by their senior playing group, you know, with Stephen Moore, the Fardies, Whites, you know, Tamuas, Leofanos, you can really sense that, you know, their, their talk out that this is really their time. They've been pretty close the last few years and you can really see that, again, they get a few guys leaving at the back end of the season um, of how they're approaching it. And that's really evident in the way they play and especially the back end of their last few weeks of their games. Tony, what do you make of the Waratahs uh, and the workload under Michael Checker, the dual roles this year? And um, obviously, um, they've had their moments, but they let it slip against the Highlanders big time last week. Yeah, they did. Highland, Highlanders, are, you know, as you saw the rugby that they played the last few weeks, they're a really difficult side to stop once they get momentum up and once they get fractured ball and they've got players that can, you know, make things from nothing really. And that's uh, that's very difficult to plan against. You know, Waratahs are always going to start difficult, weren't they? You know, the, the way or the benchmark that they set last year was absolutely incredible, their consistency and what they delivered from a game perspective, but their consistency of how they played from aggressiveness, their defence, their attack, you know, to keep that momentum going through a whole year, very, very difficult. So I'm sure they were always going to have some sort of lag, or lag to start the season. You always hope that there's not, but I think, you know, the quality of, you know, um, you know their coaching staff and their playing group, you know, I think, again, they're going to be there or thereabouts at the back end of it. Still really early doors and... Now, with this competition, I think this year you get on, you know, with two or three wins in a row, I think you're going to jump places very easily. Tony, what, what's going to win Super Rugby this year? Is it, is it going to be sparkling attack or is it going to be good, solid defence? Well, look, I think, um, you know, it has always been about the attack, hasn't it, really? You know, the defence is certainly played by the time the sides get to the final, the sides with the best defence are there. But I think attack's always been 
you know, a real focal point for Super 15 rugby. But you know, I think, you know, this year I think you've seen really the importance of the scrum and how important that has been. Restarts have been a really vital part of momentum swings in games. And I think, you know, line out maul is a really in vogue at this point in time. Everyone seems to be able to maul and how you stop that. So I think you've seen really back to how the set piece operates. And I think you're seeing sides with really strong set pieces, um, you know, come out at the end of games. Not to say that attack and defence is important, but I think the importance around the set piece and, and the, the impact forward packs are having on games in this particular start to the season um, has been a key indicator. So, Tony, long live the uh, short fat bloke then. <laughs> well, absolutely. They're, they're, they're vital, aren't they? And I think, you know, you, you're seeing that, as I said, you're looking at scrums and the penalties and the, and the influence that's had on games so far. You know, sides who are, you know, bringing off their props uh, or hookers and bringing on their second guys have been in trouble in a lot of cases. And that's had, you know, a real impact on the finish of, of all games so far. Tony, I don't think there's anyone better placed than yourself to talk about the comparisons between the uh, Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere in this week-to-week battle. And you mentioned the NFL. I mean, the Super Rugby seem like a NFL sprint to you compared to the the number of competitions you had to deal with with Munster, with Heineken Cup and the premierships. Yeah, it does look really com- completely different mindset. You know, even the way that you uh, you approach pre-season, the way that you look at your squad. Um, you know, we had big squads over there. In my last sort of three years, we were using 52, 53 players for the season, which is a huge um, amount of players and trying to, um, you know, keep in contact with those guys, obviously, and keep them connected to the group and playing time. And then we might lose 15, uh, 16 players for a stretch of three games for national duty. And then you've got uh, to go down to your next level of play. And then they've got to keep connected when everyone comes back then you're travelling every second week. So, and the season runs over, you know, 48 to 50 weeks from week uh, zero all the way through with competitions in pre-season. Super 15, it's a sprint. You need to try and keep your best 15 on the park as much as possible. Makes it difficult to blood young guys and give them three or four weeks in and then bring them out and put them back in again. You're playing test match rugby virtually every week. And it's uh, combative. You've got travel. You've got the draw up where you get your buys. Um, when you travel, who do you play in your draw if they've just come back from travel, etc. So you've got a lot of uh, factors in both, both very different, both challenging. Um, but the Super 15 one is uh, one that's enjoyable, obviously. Tony, uh, we saw some fascinating rugby in the Six Nations on the weekend. Wales uh, pipping Ireland at, at, at the post and... Uh, uh, England uh, on on course to uh, have a, have a crack, and uh, I think there's something like four sides uh, can win the championship this this weekend. But uh, one of the guys that I watched very closely uh, last weekend was uh, was Paul O'Connell. You had a lot to do with him at uh, Munster. A very special person, a very special captain. He is, and um, you know he played his hundredth Test match on, on on the weekend, which um, you know gives a fair indication of. You know, certainly the durability and the and the um, certainly the player to be able to play at that level for for that period of time. You know, some of the commentary at Paul is an amazing character. He's someone who's, in my case, is the most driven person that I've that I've been with. He not only challenges himself to get better, he absolutely demands it of the players, of the staff, and it's uh, not just the head coaches, assistant coaches, it's the chief executive, um, assistant coaches, S and C across the whole program. You know, his demand and search for excellence inside himself and the standards that he sets and rubs off on the other players is absolutely fantastic. And he's not only his action, his words, you know, you've seen uh, there's a lot of articles during the week that when he's in the dressing room before games, uh, you know, a lot of players are emotionally wound up through tears, etc. He's a really uh, um, a person that can, or- you know, orally talk exceptionally well and bring together the key messages you know, both emotionally about, you know, who you're playing for, what are you playing there and the and the opposition and bring that all together as well as backing up on the field. You know, a really special person and one that you've been involved with, you know, you're really lucky and fortunate. Obviously, um, he rates as one of the all-time greats, uh, but his repeated efforts, even in his age, are just astounding, aren't they? There's just no shirking his responsibility. Absolutely, as I said, his internal drive to, 
be a standard bearer, you know, with ever, whatever group he's with, whether, you know, then the Ireland side's lost a few of the older guys over the last few years, so Driscoll's, etc. that, you know, he's there competing with these young guys and he'd get much as much satisfaction out of playing with them and driving them on and learning off them and getting their energy as he does off the older guys, which is not always the case. Usually a lot of the older guys only respond to their peers who've been around for a long time. You know, he has the ability to really transcend through the whole age group or whatever side he's in and continue to drive himself. When I first went there in 05, 06, he was a young guy just looking for every single bit of information that he could uh, to get better. And 2015, 10 years down the track, he's exactly the same. How did, so I was going to show, how did you, now you've had some time to reflect on it, Tony, how do you reflect back on that time at Munster, uh, you know, not just as a coach, but just as a person, an Australian working in that uh, wonderful province? Yeah, look, I was extremely fortunate and lucky in timing and um, opportunity in a, in a lot of cases with coaching. Um, you know, it doesn't come around a lot. So I was the timing for me to get over that point in time where Munster had been very close the previous, um, you know, five or six years in trying to win the Heineken Cup, which is the Holy Grail in European rugby. And Munster has such a huge following and been so close and not only attracted a lot of its own supporters in the province itself and, and through Ireland, but picked up, I think, a lot of supporters around Europe and across the world with their, the way they played and the way their fans connected to the group. And I think um, that was a really exciting period and for me to get over there and be at that timing when they we ended up winning uh, you know, two Heineken Cups in, in three years there and get that first one, which is always so special. You know, I was really fortunate for myself. Rugby was at, you know, certainly a really high point in the country itself and really rugby and especially Munster in the community was inside every house um, inside that province. So there wasn't a person that wasn't affected by a site, which is a pretty amazing place to be, you know, when everyone, uh, everyone's day and everyone's uh, life was, you know, centred and lived through a sporting team. T Tony, there's, uh, when Brian O'Driscoll uh, retired, there was a lot of talk about the golden generation of Irish rugby had, uh, had gone and uh, nothing had been achieved uh, sort of too much. But you, I, I'm just getting the feeling that uh, perhaps this, this, this new crew that are, that are going, which are very well coached by Joe Smith and others, uh, seem to be in a better position to achieve than perhaps any other Ireland team in the past decade or so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I know that, you know, certainly the last, uh, you know, period of time under Eddie A. Sullivan, Declan Kidney, that they'd, you know, they certainly won a, a Six Nations with Declan and been very close with, with Eddie there. And they you know, supposedly had, not supposedly, they did have, a, you know, an exceptional group of players or generation players who'd been around. I know the Munster players to get, you know, 10 players to play, you know, virtually 200 games of senior rugby together and keep them all together in one place is pretty special. You know, we don't see a lot of it over here in rugby uh, in Australia. We see it in AFL, but it might be three or four guys, not a group of 10. And Leinster were pretty much the same. And then, really, you drew those two clubs together, which really basically formed the Irish national side. So I think expectations are really high with both clubs doing well, you know, domestically and certainly on the European stage, and probably felt a little bit down that they didn't achieve more, both through the World Cup and through, you know, regular Six Nations wins. But sometimes, as we know, you know, those players leaving and Joe and, you know, obviously Les Kiss has done, Les has done a fantastic job over you know, the last seven or eight years there. They've had various forward coaches, but those, you know, Les has been a mainstay of that coaching staff over the last period of time. And I think someone like Joe coming in who's you know, so well respected, fantastic coach. And you hear the way that the players talk about him. And these young guys have been brought into an environment where they've won, you know, 10 in a row when they're used to winning immediately which is really important and gives everyone great confidence. So, you know, I, I only see their, their continuation to get better, and I think they've got a really special group there. Um, and interesting to see when, when Paul retires, because I think he will be a huge loss and won't be easily replaced. I think with Brian going, you've got Henshaw and uh, Jared Payne in the centres there, and they've got a few other options there that they can go to. But I think Paul's loss from the forward pack will, will have a, a bigger impact, in my opinion. And what the last round showed in Six Nations, uh, Tony, was that when the World Cup comes around later in the year, those groups are going to be so tight, especially for Australia with uh, a Wales in particular and England. You know, England's scrum got tailed up by Ireland. Then we see Wales out defence uh, Ireland last weekend and we see England uh, 
doing so well to be now on top of the table. Only, what, four points in it. I think Casho, in terms of four and against, isn't there. So, Tony, uh, this is tight, and heading into the World Cup, and France could actually win as well if uh, uh, you know it, things go their way. Uh, it's so tight heading into um, England 2015. Yeah, it is, and... Um... You know, I, I, I think England, Wales and Ireland, uh, you know, they've got three very good groups. They've got, um, you know, they've got three three very good coaching groups. And I think both, you know, all their playing playing squad numbers are at a really good age to go well at a World Cup. I think England have, have built some really incredible depth. They've got a really strong set piece. Uh, they've got some big backs and they, you know, they play some, some, some good rugby and some good rugby that wins World Cup. Cup games, which I think is a really big difference. And Wales have been together for a long time with their group. Very, very, uh, you know, coaching staff that's been together for a long period of time. You know, their defence and their elements of the game um, will stack up in World Cup as they did last time around. It's pretty much the same group. And we just, we've touched on Ireland and their last 10 results against Southern Hemisphere sides as well as doing well in the European stakes. So I think the three of them are certainly on the upward rise and it's going to make, you know, really interesting last round of games in the Six Nations this weekend. Tony, t- take us back to uh, where it all started back in Brisbane, schoolboy rugby, wasn't it? Yeah, for, for, for me, I was lucky enough to uh, to, to attend Naji College um, in Brisbane and, and play rugby there. I was from a, 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 a rural town, Warwick, on the Darling Downs there, so those, uh, those areas are dominated by rugby league. So I was lucky enough to go to school in Brisbane at Nudgee, played rugby union, finished. I was at the Broncos for a few years, um, playing lower grade, 21s, etc. there. And then um, played a bit of league and then did teaching. And I uh, did a teaching degree while I was I was going through that and then uh, ended up back in teaching and ended up teaching at uh, Nudgee College in Churchy in, in Brisbane. Yeah, some of the greats, uh, Elton Flatley, uh, Peter Hewitt, my old Inverell fullback uh, cohort. So, yeah, Nudgy, great uh, breeding ground for uh, rugby. Brisbane, Queensland, full stop, really. Absolutely. You know, I, you know, the, you know, having the boarding school, which, which you know, I was, I was part of, it just, you know, there's nothing else to do but play rugby and you're going down the flats on a wet afternoon with, uh, you know, nearly 140 boys playing touch rugby or tackle rugby. It's, just a, it's a fair sight. Um, you know, ants spread out across the field playing and bashing into each other. So just a fantastic... Breeding ground for rugby. The the rugby was the heart and soul of um, you know certainly the the school in 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 those days with you know first fifteens all the way to you know tenth fifteens etc. So everyone supporting practicing war cries at lunchtime and uh, you know ten thousand people lot at, at school games on a Saturday afternoon. Certainly a great tradition and uh, one that we you know hopefully continue. Tony, uh, drop a few names of some of the uh, some of the some of the players who have kicked on from uh, from those times. Um, well, I suppose Nudgy no, had some, uh, you know, obviously Rocky Elson was uh, was in those, and you know, Rocky was a, obviously a standout player in, in, in those particular, you know, days. He was just so physical. He was a man playing against monks boys, and you know, was a, was a super competitor with regard to what he uh, what he achieved there. Um, Church, we went on. We had Carmichael Hunt. Um, with regards to how he played uh, there, who's gone on and played very well, obviously for the last with three cades there. So they're probably two of two of the main guys that we've had uh, through there, or probably two of the main profile guys. Yeah, I remember calling Rocky on C7 Sport against Terrace when he scored about a thousand tries, and I went on record then. Tony said he's going to play for the Wallabies, and. I always say Rocky, yeah, I made him because of that, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Is his goal. A uh, quick one. I've got to say, this is extraordinary to have you, Tony, and Michael Checker, both have coached the two major provinces in Ireland back in Australia at the same time. Do you, do you, um, you know, cross the notes off with each other or do you have a chat about things? Or because he's New South Wales and you're in uh, Victoria, you hate each other? No, we certainly don't hate each other, no. but uh, the, the, the colour of the, his last two jerseys uh, being Leinster. <laughs> Being blue, which is similar to New South Wales, and Munster being, um, you know, the the red with yeah, relation. Sort of maroon, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So that was very, it was very much like that too. Queensland, New South Wales, and then he's back to New South Wales now. So no, look, Michael's done terrifically well. He's, uh, you know, he's very, very highly thought of in Leinster and what he did for the program over there, and how he was a catalyst to to change their belief and bring them really on a professional basis and really give them a hard nose. Um, 
you know, so he did a fantastic job there. And I think to come back and do the same thing with the Waratahs, uh, you know, is an exception. You know, you don't do those things by mistake. And I think uh, he's done a fantastic job there as well. Tony, what, what are your thoughts about um, national team selection policy? Uh, do you feel as though that the uh, Michael should have the opportunity to, say, Paula Kane Douglas uh, from the Leinster program, Salisi Mafu out of uh, out, out of the Northampton program to, pl- to play in a World Cup. Yeah, look, I think that's that's obviously one for, for Michael and where he's where he sees the go, and also for the AR, ARU. But I think that it's just it's it's one thing us saying that and us asking those players to come back. The biggest thing is going to be the club itself. Like, are, are they going to release you know Celeste? Are they going to release uh, Kane Douglas? They paid a lot of money. Uh, for those guys to play for 12 months of the year. They haven't play, paid them that money uh, to go back and, and have international aspirations and be out of the program uh, for periods of time and risk injury. They would have gone after someone else. So I think it's one thing us having it. It's one thing the club uh, releasing them. I know if that was at Munster, we wouldn't be doing it. And if that was the case, we would have gone after a different player and that player shouldn't have been available um, or wouldn't have been considered in the first place to have that contract. So he wouldn't be in that position. So I think there's a lot of elements in place. It would be great to pick your strongest uh, side no matter where they were. But I think you know, there needs to be some sort of premise around that. And, and also the, uh, the, the, the thought of using Japan as a supplementary income to guys to keep them in Australia. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, look, personally, I think we need to be creative with what we do. And I think if we can, you know, especially guys, I think there needs to be some criteria around it. Um, you know, we don't want to see young guys going over there. I've only played two or three years of, of Super 15 rugby and going over there and, 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 you know, missing out on pre-seasons. I think if you've reached a criteria of whatever it is, but certainly a substantial amount of time playing professional rugby or plus international rugby, I think, for us to be able to do that, I think, would be creative in doing that. And also you could look at European, um, you know, medical joker situations where players that go for three months in playing Europe and miss out on maybe the NRC if they've got a, you know, a, a body of work behind them and possibly come back and then be able to start the Super 15 season. I think we need to do everything possible to keep the highest uh, calibre of player playing in Australia. We really don't want to be losing a Test 15 each year. It's very difficult and, in my opinion, unsustainable each year. We've got some great guys coming through, but when you're losing, um, you know, 15 experienced guys each year, that's very, very difficult to replace and it takes years to, to get that uh, intellectual property and calibre of player up to that standard. Absolutely. Quick one on the Ireland halves, best in the world at the moment, do you think? Oh, I think so. I just think with the influence that they have on the, have on the game, I look, they got pretty fair... Pretty fair players with Aaron, Aaron Smith and whoever they pick at 10, really. Um, but I, I think, you know, Connor and Johnny Sexton, I think that they're probably at the peak of where their games are. They've played together a lot. They know each other exceptionally well. They've been on a line, successful tour together. But I think what they influence, both from a kicking uh, and attack perspective, I think their influence on game is fantastic. And, you know, I think when they play well, it's no coincidence that Ireland do well. And uh, final one, uh, Tony, you've got the Lions at home this weekend on Friday night. You must be on guard. I mean, they were towed up last week, but the week before against Auckland, I mean, that's a pretty good effort. So you must be on guard. Yeah, we are. And we, we, we certainly felt that their, their previous um, games before they came on tour were pretty, were pretty impressive too. They were only narrowly beaten a couple of times before they came on tour. Auckland, they were terrific. They've got a, a group that don't have any big names in it, but they are extremely hard working for each other. Um, they're incredibly fit. They've got a strong forward pack, as you'd expect. Uh, a lot of left foot is kicking, and they just don't give up. And uh, for us, coming off the back of a result, we haven't done it well in the in the history. And uh, as I said, this group's got a lot of things to do for the first time this year, and, and going back to back is uh, you know really important for us this weekend. And Tony, of course, a lot of left footers down that Munster area too, weren't they? Absolutely. Well, kicking kick, kick, kick is a religion down there, I can tell you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Tony McGowan, we thank you very much. Uh, head coach of the Melbourne Rebels, good luck this weekend. Good luck for the rest of the season. And you're really starting to build something there. It's so pleasing to see for Australian rugby. No worries. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Casho. There he is, uh, Tony McGowan, joining us from Melbourne today. Casho, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Brock. What a great chat, though. Yeah, fantastic stuff. We'll see you next week on Rugger Matrix. Uh, Look forward to Six Nations and all Super Rugby this weekend. Until next week, enjoy your rugby.